Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, we we. Yeah, it's an echo. <laughs> <laughs> it's always surprising to to hear your own voice as an echo. Um, so we are a little late today. Uh, I'm sorry, we had a, a few technical uh, um, difficulties. So we're ready to start uh, the second half of our meeting uh, with a session. Uh, we'll start. Uh, Christopher Goes will be the chairman, but I'm presenting the first uh, uh, the first speaker because uh, uh, Atsushi uh, Igarashi is from uh, Kyoto University. And uh, he prepared a movie that I will uh, display uh, just now, and uh, hopefully uh, Atsushi will join us for the for the questions. And uh, I'm presenting our project Refix, uh, which is uh, about the static verifier for smart contract in Mikkelsen. And uh, this is joint work with Atsushi Igarashi and uh, Jun Furuse in Dai And um, okay, so this project started at the last middle of the September, and uh, uh, which is a starting of the start start of the funding from the Tezos. And since then, we started to build the theoretical framework, mainly theoretical framework uh, about uh, start this reflex uh, type system uh, that can deal with. Uh, uh, functional property verification for Mikos. And uh, today I'm presenting the overview, I mean the aim of, of the project and uh, uh, what we have done so far. Alright, to motivate our project, let me first present a simple contract, uh, which is a boomerang. So this contract, uh, when it is called from the outside with certain amount, uh, it uh, this contract returns that exactly the same amount to the sender. So this is realized as follows. So at the starting of the contract, we have a parameter and storage of the both unit types, so they are not very important. And uh, at the beginning of the contract, it checks whether the sent amount is the same as zero or not. If it is zero, then it is it does nothing. If it is not zero, then it uh, it um, it inspects what is the uh, what is the account of the sender, and then it sends back the same amount. This amount takes the uh, sent uh, amount, so um, it returns that amount to the sender. All right. So uh, what this contract does is um, it the send send back the exactly the same amount as the uh, amount of the tezos it receives all right so in the current uh Michelson's type system so because microson already has a, a simple type system and um, it is type checked at uh, when uh, it is executed um Already, uh, this language has certain uh, guarantee about uh, um, certain formal guarantee, static compile time guarantee. So, uh, what is a guarantee? Well, the current uh, Michelson type system guarantees about the simple type of the value. So, it means that uh, when uh, it is executed at runtime, it does not have any errors related to the confusion about the simple types. So due to this guarantee, for example, uh, we are already sure that uh, before executing this CUDA re instruction, the top of, of the stack is already a pair. So uh, it is not the case. It, it, it cannot be some, uh, some atomic value. Also, for example, uh, here, uh, we have if comp eq uh, instruction. Um, executed to uh, uh, amount of the amount of the money so uh, our type system Michelson's type system already guarantees that when this instruction if comp eq is executed then it does the comparate comparison between uh, tezos amounts not uh, about for example tezos amount and integer amount also, uh, when we execute contract uh, instruction, which uh, converts the address into the contract object, it, we 
uh, it is definitely a case that uh, uh, we have the address. We can be sure that the top of top element of the stack is already an address. Also, uh, before executing transfer tokens, our type, the Mikkelson's uh, current type system guarantees that uh, the type of the stack object is uh, the correct, I mean the uh, contract object and the sent uh, amount and so on, and the argument. All right. But uh, our uh, the aim of the uh, the aim of our project Reflex is to uh, extend enhance the Mikkelson's type system so that we can guarantee more properties uh, at the compile time. So what I mean is that uh, we are developing a type system that can uh, guarantee that this uh, Mikkelson contract um, indeed satisfy the intended functional property. So what is the intended functional property of the boomerang? Well, this is a, because this is a boomerang contract, if this contract is called and the, if the amount of the sent money is zero tezos, zero tz, then uh, nothing happens. If the amount is not zero, then uh, the same amount is sent back to the sender. So, uh, for example, from this guarantee, if we could guarantee and uh, we are uh, doing the work to uh, indeed this is uh, guaranteed at the compile time but uh, when this uh, functional property is guaranteed then uh, for example we are already sure that um, the caller that is caller's money is not stolen by others before the call so because uh, all this functional property guarantees that uh the o only the contract involved in this uh contract invocation is this contract and the sender uh we are already sure that there is no malicious third party that tries to uh that uh st steals the money uh, that is communicated between these two persons all right, so uh, to summarize, our project aims to uh, develop a type system, uh, develop a framework uh, that by as an extension of the Mikkelson type system so that it can guarantee more functional properties of a contract than the current type system. So current type system guarantees a simple, uh, simple type property, but we want to uh, guarantee the functional property. Also, uh, we all we uh, it is in, in it is included in the goal that uh, to implement a semi -automa automated static verifier. So we we do not only the theory but also uh, implementing the verifier, right? So uh, here is an our approach. So uh, we do this um, extension of the type system by uh, refinement types, and then uh, we we are doing uh, we our extension can guarantee the functional property verification by using this refinement types property. So refinement types. What is refinement types? Refinement types is a variant of the type system, which is uh, basically an extension of base uh, simple type system uh, that can carry the refinement information in, in addition to the simple type. So uh, uh, let me explain by example. So when we write int in the current type system of the Mikkelson, it means that uh, uh, it is an integer type. So the, it is a type, but uh, it includes all the integers. In the refinement type system, in addition to uh, this x, this information of uh, x is int, we can write some uh, predicate uh, in, in the type. And uh, this predicate is called a refinement to the uh, type information. If we write a uh, predicate, for example, x is greater than zero in this way, then uh, this type, this whole ta refined type, refinement type, um, includes only the positive integers. So when we write int, it includes all the integer value, values, but uh, when we write in this way, this type includes a positive integer. 
if we write in this way, so we can write the uh, refinement to the some kind of uh, composite values, and uh, we can write, uh, for example, a uh, type like this. So a pair uh, of x and y. Uh, so it is a pair of integer, and uh, its refinement says that the first element is strictly greater than the second element. So in this way, we can um, we can say that uh, we can create a type that uh, um, that consists of uh, pairs whose first value is greater than second value. We can also mention. A uh, our, the type system can also mention a uh, function type. So this is a function that receives an integer and returns an integer. And uh, this says that uh, we say that we call uh, the received value x and then the return value is another integer uh, which is named y but the returned value is strictly greater than the received value. So in this way, uh, we can extend the type system so that uh, every place, um, not every place, but uh, if it is needed, uh, we can add a refinement information so that we can uh, guarantee uh, more property than the simple type. that receives an integer and returns an integer and uh, this says that uh, we say that we call uh, the received value x and then the return value is another integer uh, which is named y but the returned value is strictly greater than the received value. So in this way, uh, we can extend the type system so that uh, every place, um, not every place, but uh, if it is needed, uh, we can add a refinement information so that we can uh, guarantee uh, more property than the simple type. Right. So um, this refinement type is already uh, successfully uh, applied to a program verification, but uh, uh, here we are applying this type system to uh, uh, Michelson's, type, uh, Michelson's functional property checking. Right, so we are considering uh, by using this type system, so uh, we are starting to formalize uh, this refinement type system for Michelson. So we don't have much thing, much detailed thing about uh, our type system uh, here, but uh, we are considering that this architecture of the verifier. So our verifier takes a Michelson code that is annotated with the specification of a contract so uh, which means that uh, 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 the annotation in a, as a refinement types um, that express a function property so for example in the boomerang case uh, it expresses uh, if it is uh, it, it uh, gives back the money that is received then this annotated contract is passed to the reflex static verifier. This verifier uh, interacts with the 
SMT solver, which is an uh, uh, enhanced solver with uh, uh, some theory. And um, this reflex static verifier generates a verification condition, uh, which is a sufficient condition for this contract to be indeed safe. Safe in the sense that uh, specification is met. And then uh, this SMT solver uh, checks whether this verification condition is indeed uh, valid or not. If uh, this verification succeeds, then uh, we can execute um, this uh, Microsoft contract. So we can deploy this contract on a chain. If it is not uh, satisfied, then uh, this contract may violate the specification. So uh, we need, we at least need to uh, check whether the uh, the original Microsoft code is indeed correct or not. So we maybe we do not deploy this contract as is. Okay, so uh, this is a plan of our reflex project. So uh, we do th both theory and implementation. So at the theory part, we first uh, formalize a mini Microsoft language. So uh, if we deal with the whole entire Microsoft language, then uh, it is too much uh, to formalize a type system. So first we uh, designate the mini Microsoft language and then uh, we design a type system for this mini language. And uh, so uh, here we formalize operational semantics and simple type system. And here we can uh, refer to, for example, uh, existing work about uh, Mitchell Koch and uh, also uh, some other work about the mini Microsoft language. And then uh, we extend uh, this type system for mini Microsoft language uh, with the refinement types. Then uh, we prove the soundness of re reflex. So soundness means that the type, if the type check is uh, type check succeeds, then um, whatever the uh, what in in the every execution of the uh, this type checked contract does not uh, result in a uh, specification violation. And for implementation part, we uh, implement an automated verifier. So uh, what is important here is that we uh, want a verifier that has uh, annotation about the specification and uh, not about the uh, um, type annotation for every expression. So uh, we want this uh, static verifier to be uh, able to uh, infer as much implicit type assumption as possible and uh, we are uh, currently and uh, we, the current status is that we already uh, formalized the mini microsoft language and uh, we are now uh, working on the extension with the refinement types and the uh, implementation part is ongoing and uh, we are currently looking at how to um, how to get a simple type uh, expressions from the uh, Tezos client, current Tezos client implementation. Right, so uh, we are, we are, um, so uh, the, although the extension with refinement types is um, quite uh, going really smoothly, we envisage these these technical challenges so uh, for example one is that uh, expressing the effects of the operations so uh, indeed the the microsoft language has several effect for instructions for example contract creation token transfer and delegate and uh, we so uh, as a practical verifier uh, we want to include we want to include these effect for instruction to to be captured by a refinement type system and uh, because uh, in the microsoft language these effects are expressed as a form of the operation which is a value returned from the uh, written from the contract. So uh, we want uh, a good refinement language that can express the effect that is caused by these uh, operations. Also, another challenge we are already looking at is that the refinement types for data types. So Microsoft has uh, data types, several data types such as maps, 
set list and options and the um, refinement types for these data types is uh, we need to um, look at several design choices for example how to express a refinement to uh, composite data structures or whether we want to uh, write a refinement for um, every element and so on all right so we already uh, we we started to looking at the design of the implementation and uh, we encountered one difficulty in the uh uh, in our implementation that is uh, the current uh, Tezos project we don't have a, a front end for Michelson. What do I mean? Well, uh, we mean a parser or type checker and uh, simple type checker and so on. And uh, these um, parser and the simple type checkers are um, bundled in the Tezos client implementation and uh, um, it is not factored out. But uh, this front end part is uh, indeed uh, what we need when we analyze the Michelson code. And uh, if the this part is factored out as an independent uh, library, we are very, uh, very uh, grateful <laughs> if it is the case. But uh, currently, we are uh, planning to uh, implement our own parser and uh, our own parser and type checker. And uh, in this way, it is difficult to um, track the change that is uh, made to the Tezos client. So the, it is really helpful if uh, this part is factored out as an independent library. Right, so to conclude, we are doing the project Reflex, which is an extension of the current Michelson type system with refinement types. By doing this, uh, we can express a functional specification of a contract with uh, refinement types. And uh, we are also implement, uh, we are also uh, planning to design automated verification as type inference for the Reflex type system and uh, implementing the uh, verify your based on this. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'm trying to to connect to um, to uh, uh, Atsushi uh, via Zoom. Give me two minutes. We can try two minutes more and, and then otherwise we'll skip the question, unfortunately. The, the it ends in 002. Yes. Hello, hello. So, uh, Atsushi, can you hear um, us? Uh, yes. Uh, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Christopher, can you manage to read the question? And if uh, they need to be repeated, can you come to the laptop? <laughs> Thanks, Atsushi. Uh, questions? Well, if not, I have a question, so I'll ask it. Uh, if you add other data types like sets and maps, will you be able to express properties like something is a member of a set or not as a member of a set in the right Feynman types? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> other questions?
So in the refinement types, do you support arbitrary Mickelson predicates, or are they from a specific sub-language of Mickelson? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't decided uh, yet about the, uh, the language for refinements, but then, uh, we are going to uh, use some uh, SAT solvers or SMT solvers. So it depends on uh, which backend we, we are going to use. Other questions? Hello, Atucci. It's Antonio Rivara here. Uh, uh, I can, I can hear you well. Uh, Antonio Rivara here. Hello, Good morning. So the the question is, um, a big part of the a contract is the protocol, and using refinement types, how do you express the causality on calling an action after calling another action? Uh, uh, I understand the use in the context of data, but not on this context of uh, sequentiality of possible executions with respect to the, to the Sorry, I, I, of actions. Sorry, I have a sheet here the question. Um, well, um, using, using dependent function types, we can express, uh, the relationship between input and output. And also, we expect that we can express, uh, for example, uh, the resulting, uh, list of operations in the output, uh, depending on the input. Other questions? All right, thanks again. And next up is Rick yeah, Carr thank you. from Runtime Verification talking about Kay Mickelson. This thing on? Huh? Oh, <laughs> great. Mickelson is funded by the Tesla's Foundation. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many have heard of the K framework? How many have used it for anything? Great. <laughs> but then I know the level. Um, here's what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm just going to give you an overview of what K Mickelson is. Uh, I'm going to do a little K introduction here on the slides. Then I'm going to show you a bit more of the semantics. I intended this to be more like a demo and show you on the on the screen, but it's going to be in the PDF format, so bear with me there. And in the end, again, it's going to be a, a PDF demo. I'm going to prove things and say that here's when you run, run something, the prover proves it, and you have to take my word for it, or I can show you in the break uh, that it actually works. Please ask questions. Um, don't wait until the end if something's unclear. Um, K Mickelson is just a name we have for specifying Mickelson in the K framework. We usually just do that. We slap a KM on the front. I mainly work on K Wasm, for example. Um, 
K is a framework for creating executable specifications, which you probably know. So you write down your specification, and it's runnable. But, um, and it uses rewrite-based sem rewrite semantics. So those of you who read the Mickelson doc documentation, it should look very familiar. Um, and the goal of this project is to use this executable spec to do formal verification. Um, and this is not the first blockchain language we're working with. I'm working on KWASM, for example, which is we're kind of targeting KEWASM, like Ethereum WASM. We have uh, a semantics of the EVM, which is used heavily for verifying real world contracts, like the DAI contracts has been verified with cert. I'm sure it's been audited with something else, but a lot of the verification is done with the KVM. The design of K Mickelson is going to look pretty familiar to you. Uh, it's a very faithful translation of the, K, uh, of the Mickelson spec. There are a few differences. For one thing, we don't really, um, like, it's a spec, so it's going to use these non-obviously computational side conditions. So, like, you know, this function, um, I'll, I'll show you later. It's, we, we have to do calls through functions sometimes to get, get it, the spec to be computational. Um, we make some state explicit that is not explicit in the, in the docs, like the mu test. Like, we have to actually put that somewhere so we can access it as a value. Uh, and we don't really implement the typing semantics because we usually take this approach that if you want to type your language, write a type checker, that's great, and we focus on the execution. So we just assume this is type checked already, uh, which just th there's not much point mo mostly to do the typing semantics in K as well. Um, in the end, we want to like you want to verify your contracts, have people write contracts and ask us to verify them. That's what we do. Um, and in the end, of course, it would be great if we could have a similar contract or a similar, or just a, maybe a, a subdirectory in this, uh, in this Git repo where we have the verified smart contracts that we have done for KVM. Status, like, where are we at with this? Bulk of the semantics are done. There are a few things missing. Um, I'm pretty new to Mickelson, so what I'm hearing is that this language can change a lot quicker than a lot of other languages, so we just keep updating it uh, as it happens. It's pretty easy. It's not much work to implement a new rule most of the time. Um, macros are not done. Annotations are underway, as far as I understand. Um, and the bytes operations we have left out for now, apparently because we were told, don't worry about them right now. Um, we have had a few successes, for example, uh, when we take this spec and create an interpreter from it, it's actually pretty performant. We've had some numbers that indicate that we're faster on certain executions than you know the, the handwritten interpreter. That's also because we're not doing gas metering. So like it, it's, it's not a fair comparison. It's just like you know we're we're we have this tool that you write a spec and it just generates the interpreter and all the tools, and it's like within an order of magnitude of what you'd expect. So I mean, you could specify your language and then don't write the interpreter right now. Just get the one, use the one you get from K in many, in many projects. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that's with the new LLVM backend that we have. Um, I've been playing around with this for a few days. I usually verify Wasm programs, so I'm kind of playing around with verifying some Mickelson programs. What uh, we were just shown here, I, I didn't have time to type it down because uh, I only realized, oh wait, I could probably verify this. But I, I think. If, uh, I think I could verify the property that was, we were just trying to verify right now, uh, saying like you know th that contract is never going to uh, change the balance. Um, so we can do some cool proofs already. Um, and the cool thing is like we just r write one specification and the tools come out. We don't write separate tools. We just write the specification and then K has been doing this for quite a few years. So it's going to produce good, pretty performant tools right off the bat. It's going to be demo time, which is just another slide. Um, so sorry, I, I ported this to slides instead of I usually show it on the computer. Uh, so it's going to be a few bad formatting th things. But basically what I'm saying here is like we are just doing a loop that's summing the first 100,000 naturals. And that takes about six seconds on my machine. There's about a bunch of multi-core stuff, but that's just a parsing. So 
about five, five it's, it's like, it took, se took six seconds to run like some 100,000 numbers. And half of that, at least, is just parsing time. So that's pretty cool for an auto-generated interpreter, I think. So I say reasonably fast. It's not the fastest, but it's pretty performant. Um, I want to show you the Michelson semantics we have. But to do that, I also kind of need to show you what K looks like. The good thing is it's going to be pretty intuitive for those of you who are familiar with Michelson, because it just mostly looks the same. And there are, there's a few differences. But first, the pitch. I've been hinting at this. What's the, what's the vis vision behind K? Well, the way I like to phrase it is, like, what, if, you, what, if, you if you build a new language, don't hire five PhD students to do all of these, like write your verifier, write your test, like parsers, write your interpreters, write your model checkers as separate tools. Just specify your language and get all the tools for free. And then if you want to write like some specialized tool, something you really, really want to make your own for, that's great. But the idea is once you have a spec, you should be able to derive everything you need. The spec is complete, in a sense. Uh, so specify your language with syntax and sem semantics, and then get your tools for free. Avoid the m times n problem, basically, where you have to write all these things separately for every language. Uh, yeah, the tools we get, like parser, interpreter, debugger, reachability logic prover, which is obviously the one we're, I wouldn't say we're most proud of, but the one I use most and the one that's really interesting for blockchain use cases, because that's how we can verify contracts. Uh, not for toy, la toy languages. We have full specs of all of Java 4, uh, C11, JavaScript. was well, actually easier than you think, apparently, to formalize JavaScript. Um, the EVM. I'm working on Wasm, uh, LLVM, and x86 underway. Um, other people are working on Solidity and Rust semantics. So what I want to show here is that, well, it's not a specific sort of language. It's not a specific subset of a language. We have high-level languages. We have low-level languages. Uh, we have, they're not here, but like we, we do have like functional languages, logic programming languages. This operational semantics works pretty well for <coughs> most types of languages. Um, and if you want to write a spec in K, it's three things. You need a syntax, you need configuration, and you need uh, just <coughs> your operational semantics. Syntax is BNF. We have some, so just an instruction can be any number of things. Um, you can, we have this like built-in thing, so you can make lists with certain separators. Uh, yeah. Straightforward. Then you have the state, which is configuration. It's basically you say, what is the entire state of the program? Um, that, and one special thing is we always have this KSL, which is basically where the program resides. So uh, the execution works like you put the program in the KSL to begin with. And then your rules consume this program while changing the state. And in the end, you usually have an empty KSL and a big state change. And it's written with this XML-like notation because that makes parsing easy. If you're, because you're specifying syntax, like if, if you want to give, make the, this a param type a token in your language, it's going to be pretty hard if you used a JSON-like configuration to di disambiguate what your rules are supposed to say. So it's not always the prettiest thing to look at, but it works pretty well. Um, usually comes up a question like, why did you use, why does it look like XML? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, and th these are just like some initial, initial values we need to put something in, and then when you invoke your contract, all these cells, like the balance and the amount, they just get populated, and then your contract proceeds. Um, transition rules should look pretty similar to what you're used to seeing. Uh, there's a rule that says like if at the head of the case cell you have this, then rewrite it to dot, and at the stack rewrite the dot at the head of the cell to x. So this is basically this uh, syntax you're used to. There's a rewrite arrow. There's a wildcard. Uh, we usually write variables in all caps. So that, that's wrong. Well, not all the words in all caps are variables. But uh, that's, how, that's what it's like in, in Wasm. So. Um, so this dot, dot, dot means like at the head of the cell. Th there's just some syntactic sugar in there that you don't have to worry about. Um, we don't need to mention all the cells. We just mention the cells we modify. 
uh, rewrite to dot is raising, and we just the rewrites look like this. You take every cell and just rewrite their contents separately, so we can touch several cells at once. You can do general like functional programming. So it's like a reverse list function. You just say, well, this thing here, this syntax production um, defines a function, and then you don't need to mention any context context when you write the rule. You don't have to say, well, in the case all this happens, this can just apply anywhere immediately. And in the back end, like in Haskell back end, this just basically turns into a function the way you'd expect. Um, just something more, slightly more complicated. Um, here's the slicing operation. So we do have side conditions. Uh, we don't usually don't do the computation in them, uh, but you know, oh, that's <laughs> There's an O and a zero there. Um, but yeah. So th there's requires clauses, which is side conditions. There's also ensures clauses, which is post conditions. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry for the predicates not, or the um, operation, operators not being polymorphic. We specialized them by type. That's just what it looks like. Um, we have built in maps. So the data type map is pretty easy to implement. Empty map turns into an empty map. Uh, get, we have this syntax. Um, to just get an element, and then this is a typecast because the maps are general, general, generally sorted. So in this case, I'm not sure it's absolutely necessary. You can do this so you don't have to do a cast, but in this case, we just cast it. Um, updates, yeah, this updates value, this deletes it. <laughs> Here's where I usually pull up the computer and show you the semantics side by side. But instead, I have, and this might be sm slightly small font. Um, I'm not sure if this is entirely readable. I just want to show you something side by side. Like, well, you already saw the push. So my point here is like, if you just look at the whatever comes after this little um, right bracket here, and compare it to this it should be a pretty small eyeball distance between these things. Um, yeah, here we use like a specialized production just to wrap it in something. Um, right, here's a more complex case where we have map, uh, map over a body here. So here, th this uses the where clause in this way. We can't really do that. So what we do is we just, if we map, we do use this function perform map, where this is the map we consume, this is the map we produce, and then here's like the, the block of code where um, we're mapping over. So then, then it becomes slightly more complex. Not everything maps very easily to, to K, but usually it's pretty straightforward. Does it seem very confusing or just very boring? And the, the, my, what I'm hoping to convey here is that this is really boring, which it should be, because we're just we're trying to translate a spec and ha give you a high uh, a feeling of assur assurance that, yeah, this is probably this probably does the right thing. Right? So it's supposed to be boring. Um, I'm doing pretty good on time, so uh, I'm going to jump into what proving looks like. Any questions so far? Great. <laughs> so from the chemicals and semantics, or any semantics, K just generates a parser uh, and a deductive program verifier. You write a verification, verif uh, a verification claim exactly the way you write these transition rules. So the transition rules of your semantics become the axioms. And what you do is when you, state, when you try to prove something, is you, state, you state something new in the same way and say, please try to prove that this is a theorem. Um, and the way our proofs are interpreter, interpreted is sort of like weak, weak all path reachability. So we're saying every, every, non, every terminating path, if you write rule A, rule A rewrites to B, that means on every path, A will eventually always evaluate to B, and you, or unify with B and match all the like, post conditions, or not terminate. Non-termination maps to anything. Um, the automatic pr prover tries to construct a proof. Sorry, that's not the right phrasing. It tries to prove it. We don't actually produce proof objects yet. That's underway. Um, uses C3 to check con constraints. You can plug in uh, other SMT solvers if you prefer. Uh, and just make sure that tr tries to prove the claim. 
And if the prover fails, which it does, because you, you probably did something wrong or something is not clear to it, uh, you have to inspect the output and see, like, is, is your spec wrong? Is there a bug in your semantics? Is, the, is your program wrong? Uh, or does the prover need some help? Usually, this is the most common case. Like, the prover needs to be able to reason about certain fun built-in functions or something. So you need to add some lemmas. Demo time again, but on slides. Here's a super, super simple program. I tried to write up the program we, we saw before in the previous presentation, but I didn't have time. But I'll show you later. But this is a slightly less interesting program. Uh, <coughs> just takes the input pair and rewrites it to nil and the sum. This goes through immediately. This doesn't, doesn't need any help. If you want to say something like, hey, I, if, 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 if you for some reason believe that these are nats instead of ints, or that Mikkelsen only works on natural numbers. Um, in K, we do that. We always use um, representatives bigger than zero. So this would be a reasonable property to state. Uh, we have the same program. But now I say, well, the, when the program terminates, one thing we will know for sure is that whatever x is here, it's going to be larger than a. Obviously, that's false. Um, but I just want to show you this. We can say ensures that states uh, requested final property post condition that's going to be checked with C3. Uh, that's going to fail. And basically, the prover is going to say, hey, A plus B is larger than A equals true not. Basically, well, A is, a is uh, larger or equal than A plus B. And I still end up here. Then what if that's the case? Sorry, that should be an A, not a 0. What if that's the case? And the way you would solve this in this case, or one way you can solve it is say, like, well, oh, yeah, this only works with b is larger than 0. Super toy example, but just to give you a sense of, like, what does it look like? Here's the kind of th things you write. Here's the kind of things you get when you screw up. Yeah, it's a simplified workflow of proving things in k. This passes, yeah. Uh, I can show you how fast this runs on my computer. I can show you some more um, running more programs and show you how, what it looks like. Uh, happy to demo it for you. Uh, because it's, I know it's pretty boring to just look at the slides. Conclusion. Um, I'd say we're pretty good at formalizing languages in K at this point, after what, 25 years of doing it. Uh, and it's pretty cool, because like from a single spec, you derive, I've only talked about the interpreter and the, uh, the prover, but we have like program equality checkers and other cool tools that you can use for your, your purposes. So if you want to do any formal verification, and if you're developing a language, we might, it might be a good idea for us to talk and see if we can help each other out. Um, like I said, like the languages we, we can formalize, it's all kinds, imperative, stack-based, register-based, OO, functional logic, low-level, high-level. We've done the lot. Um, and the tools that you get are pretty good. Like from a single spec, you get pretty good tools. Sometimes really good tools. Um, yeah, and we can usually customize. I mean, the, the tools that we generate are evolving. And they usually evolve through us <coughs> having a grant or working with some organization who's trying to do something that we haven't really made K do before. And that way, we just develop K further, and we get better, better tools. Sometimes we um, customize the tools for special purposes. Like Firefly is uh, like customizing the KVM to fit into Truffle and that whole uh, ecosystem. And that takes some you know, special tuning of our tools to make that work. Uh, so if, if you see K and d don't think that it's doing what you want to, talk to us and maybe we can work something out. Um, <coughs> yeah, talk to us. Or me. Or yeah. Thanks for listening. It's my sources. Yeah. Questions? Questions. Hi, do you have any sort of coverage checking for the rules, or are they just you go through all the paths and they end up in Z3, and if Z3 finds a contradiction, then <laughs> it finds a contradiction? 
Well, what do you mean coverage checking? Like uh, so, so you had a case earlier. I think mm -hmm. it was something like you had a, a zero case and a positive case for natural numbers. Yeah. So that that covers all of the natural numbers, right? Yeah. So can you check that, like, that all of the rules that you have defined for that function actually cover all of the input? Oh, um, I I've, I've been playing around with this. I think you can do it, um, but it's not. Like reachability logic is it's very easy to automate, but it's not as powerful as other certain other logical frameworks we're trying to expand into uh, mu logic, which is more an all encom encompassing logic. But I mean you could say things like, well, this function Yeah, if if you can state it as a reachability claim, saying like I mean every, everything's symbolic, right? So if you if you put something on the case, if, if I just, instead of this program here, I just put uh, a P for a pro general program and say, well, every program is going to do this thing, then in theory, you can say the reachability claim. It's probably going to be hard to get the prover to accept that and try everything. There's going to be a lot of timeouts in C3 and so on. Um, but I, I've, been trying to, I've been playing around with something similar, I think, to what you're asking in, with memory in, in Wasm, because we... The, m the way we model the memory there is as byte maps is we actually m the fastest way to do it is actually to map use it as a map from int to int, but then we have to maintain the invariance, right? Uh, so right now we just in every proof we just state the invariance, saying oh well you know everything is going to be a byte, so we're fine. But I've been trying trying to prove that well whatever memory you start with and whatever instruction you do, the invariance should still hold. Not quite been getting that to play ball, but. I mean, I, I think I, I've been able to write down the property, but the prover is like, it tries to unify and then sends like, you know, um, all its side conditions, like the path conditions to C3, and C3 gets like usually a timeout about, you can set the timeout, and you, in theory you can just say, you know, give C3 a day to prove every possible claim, and then you have a pretty good chance of it working out, but feasibility issues. Further yeah. questions? <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> so when you when you define your, the semantics of, of your language mm -hmm. uh, using K, does K help detecting mistakes you've done in the semantics, like every program diverges, or if I do something in the semantics that is wrong, or in the type system that is <coughs> allows uh, 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 some computations to go wrong? So does K help to detect these mistakes? Uh, short answer is no, not really. Um, it's more like developing. I, the issue here is like developing the semantics is sort of like you know developing your interpreter, but in a high level functional like language. So you still need your unit test and your conformance test to make sure you get things to go through. Divergence checking. No, I don't think there's anything. I mean, you you could state it as a, as a as a proof claim and say like you know every program diverges. But again, like I don't think it's usually not going to be feasible. Depends on the size of the language. Uh, I mean, some programs diverge, and we're talking about all path reachability here. <laughs> so you'd probably end up with a bunch of claims. Like if you would say something like ev every program diverges except when it's supposed to diverge, and then it's a weird claim to to prove. Uh, but generally, no. I mean, I, I'd say developing the semantics is sort of like you know, it's your basic software engineering problem of trying to make it right according to a specification. The good thing, I think, you know, the, the thing we have ahead of other frameworks is that this rewrite-based um, <coughs> specification is pretty popular. Wasm uses it, and Mixing uses it, obviously. So you can get a pretty good eyeball distance in saying things like, you know, I mean, it's sort of like you know the, the documentation. How how do you check that the documentation does the right thing? Well, you you can't really. But so K is just a next level mechanization of of what the documentation looks like with a close eyeball distance. Uh, but no, it's it's like writing writing an interpreter. Any other questions? And I do screw up a lot. <laughs> happens. Thanks again. Next up, uh, Luis Pedro, uh, Mario Pereira, I apologize for butchering your names, and Simao Mello on Mickelson Semantics in Y3. So, okay, 
it just goes in my pocket. Okay, so hi. Uh, instead of this being uh, a regular half an hour presentation, uh, I will present uh, a 15 minute uh, presentation and then my colleague will present part of his work. So, hi. Good morning for everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Orta and uh, I'm going to present uh, some joint work with Mario Pran and Simo, Simo Melzosa, which are uh, here as well. And I'm going to talk about Michelson semantics in Y3. So, uh, in this presentation I'm going to uh, give a, a little bit of uh, an unusual introduction because we're going to start with the big picture. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the motivation that led us to pursue these goals. Then we're going to show you what we've actually done so far, and then we'll finish with some conclusions. So what's the big picture? What are we aiming for? We're aiming for a LIGO Mikkelsen certified certifying compiler. And what do we mean by this? It's a certified compiler is a compiler that preserves the, the semantic between a, a LIGO written uh, contract and a Mikkelsen translated contract. Uh, the certifying part of that compiler is that it would generate verification conditions based on uh, user supplied in, uh, information. So basically we would have a LIGO written contract plus some annotations. Uh, we then have a, a, a Y3 plugin that would uh, take that LIGO code and the, the annotations, translate it to YML as an intermediate language, generate some SMTs that would be dispatched uh, the, some VCs that would be dispatched to, to SMTs, and then uh, finally we would have this certified compilation uh, here, uh, and would get a certified Mikkelsen contract. What's our motivation behind this? Uh, our motivation is that uh, uh, we would only need the uh, programmers to to know LIGO and some. Um, specification uh, language and uh, uh, this specification language would be uh, embedded directly in the smart contract um, and uh, the being able to prove properties of your smart contract written in LIGO uh, we think it's uh, a thing that one can hope for um, and another thing uh, which we try to do but it's not so easy it's to minimize the user interaction with the underlying proof tool, in this case, Y3. So what do we need to achieve our goal? We need a big step operational semantics in the Mikkelsen side of things, as well as an axiomatic semantics. In the LIGO side of things, we need both those semantics plus a behavioral specification language. And uh, currently, sorry, currently we, we have this one, uh, this one we're working on, and as you'll see in the next slides. So, you all know Mikkelsen, you had an introduction yesterday about it. Uh, mainly it's a stack, re uh, it's a stack rewriting language, uh, it's amenable to formal verification, the twist properties of strongly typed language uh, and the functional paradigm. Uh, so you all know that we only have three types of runtime errors for a well-typed Mikkelsen uh, program, which are division by zero, token exhaustion and gas exhaustion. First one is easily avoidable by the, the, the return type of the Euclidean division algorithm, being an option type, that is. And I'm just I'm not going to bore you with all the details, just going to show you why uh, we chose Y3, uh, because its types uh, mainly correspond to the ones already, uh, uh, the ones in the standard library of Y3 already correspond to the ones on, um, on the Mikkelsen language, except for uh, the natural numbers that do not exist naturally in Y3, so we had to define them, but I'll show you that afterwards. And uh, we chose sequences instead of arrays uh, because we don't need to have pointers in this situation because these are all constants, so we chose to use sequences instead of arrays. So how did we define our type natural? So as we were supposed to do it in the most usual way, so we have O and the successor of a natural. All the, the natural functions, we had to, to define them by ourselves, and they all look like this. So it's just a, an example. Another thing is, uh, in Mikkelsen, we can do comparisons, and type comparable means a, a great deal. So this is our, we define this type comparable, and then uh, we, have, we took the same approach as the, the Michel Koch guys did. Uh, we had this sort of monad for results uh, of our eval function. Uh, which we, we have uh, uh, this type, it, which is stack t, uh, when, whenever it uh, goes okay, and no more fuel that simulates 
the norm of yield, not to be confused with the gas. It's just for termination purposes. And then we have this error, uh, which is here only to simulate uh, typing errors. So, as according to the, the Michelson specification, <coughs> all compression functions must return an integer. So, yet again, we had to define those uh, by ourselves. Here's, here's another uh, example of a compression function, this time between two booleans. Pretty straightforward to understand. And then, as you all know, the Michelson uh, stack only contains data or, or instructions, so we had to define our type data as shown here. And for the, the Michelson stack, we chose to, to, to represent it by a list, uh, and there's a list of well-formed data. What is this? The well-formed data is just a predicate that ensures that all our data is well-formed. Okay. We had to define a couple more predictors, uh, such as well-formed map, which is here, and well-formed instruction, uh, but it doesn't fit in this slide. Uh, please don't mind the beamer. It's just created some, li some links there for no reason. OK, so here's our eval function. Uh, as you can see, it takes a, an in stack as an input. It has a fuel <coughs> argument. It takes an instruction, and it returns the semantic results. We have here a precondition, for those of you who are not familiar with Y3, that uh, says that we need to have a fuel at least greater or equal than zero. And then we have this variant fuel, which helps Y3 uh, using uh, uh, external provers to prove the termination of this function. Uh, so uh, as you can see, this, for instance, the, the, the sequence, uh, we're going to eval the, 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 the first one, take that result, and then pass it down to Andy Valid, the second one. Just pretty much straightforward, as you'd expect in an ML-like program. Again, we had to, to make uh, some uh, auxiliary, fun auxiliary functions, such as uh, make well-formed data and make well-formed instruction, so that we could have an invariant on type, so that uh, we could make sure that uh, uh, every time we have a, a, a well-formed uh, record, instruction, it's always uh, well-formed. It's just a record with a just one, uh, uh, one thing in it. Okay, so our first intuition was to prove that uh, that fuel actually doesn't uh, have any uh, uh, interference in the, the computation itself. So for every fuel1, fuel2 input stack and input instruction, as long as we have a fuel1 and fuel2 greater than zero and fuel2 greater than fuel1, the, the computations of both of these, the computation with fuel1 and the computation of fuel2 must be the same. So, here's the proof of that, uh, here's a, a photo of that proof session, uh, and now let's give you some, stack, some stats about that session and some hard conclusions that we reached. First one, we had uh, over 6,500 verification conditions. Uh, for recursive calls, we had to use induction over fuel one. All the goals were proved only the, using only the Altergo SMT. What's the hard conclusions that we, that we reached? First, uh, Y3 offers a night lightweight uh, for uh, uh, interactive mode for, for doing proofs. But uh, it's not the most suitable to do meta theory uh, because we still have to do a lot of interaction, uh, especially when it comes to induction that is currently out of reach of the SMTs. Uh, but uh, we intend to, to explore another, uh, another method for for reaching our goal uh, of the certified uh, compiler, uh, which is going to be presented by Clochard uh, in Popol 20, which is based on, uh, ha has the idea of ghost monitors uh, to, to, to help in compiler uh, verification. Yes. So what? OK. This one? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay uh, 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 even uh, actually, I could show you another one that's uh, equivalent to this one, where you have all the all the other cases where you have uh, an error or you have a, a no more fuel. I can show you that, but maybe due to time, we can show you yeah. offline. 
And what are we go what are we working on right now? We uh, right now we're working on uh, an axiomatic semantics. This is just uh, an example. Uh, even the the add case over here is not complete. We only have the integers here, but this is still like a space in the slide. Uh, and this is what we're, we're working on right now, and uh, has a future work. We we actually have a parallel ongoing task. We are adding the, those new <coughs> uh, instructions that were added to Mikkelsen because the, the previous version that we had uh, didn't contemplate uh, none of those. Dug and dig and we, we didn't have those. We also don't have uh, um, the, the cryptographic primitives uh, there. Uh, we just assume they exist. Uh, so we would also like to, to prove the the multi-sig contract in uh, in Y3. Then we have to formalize the behavior specification language for LIGO. Uh, this language takes an inspiration in the gospel language for a camel uh, that was presented uh, in the, the formal methods back in October. Uh, then this goal, I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, uh, OK, everyone wants to do It's like winning the lottery. Uh, everyone wants to, to, to specify a gas model, a gas cost model. So we want to do it as well, or at least try to. Let's see who, who actually comes up with a, a good idea for that. Uh, then we want to formalize semantics for LIGO in my tree, so because we need to do that in order to assure that our compiler would be uh, certified and, and for that matter. Uh, and finally, we would like to, this is the big picture, to have the, the LIGO Mikkelsen certified certifying computer, uh, compiler. In conclusions, we already have a big step semantics in the form of an evaluator in Y3. We are currently working on the axiomatic semantics, and this is our plan towards creating a verification platform for the Thesel smart contracts. So thanks for your kind attention and questions. Questions? So I noticed you used piano natural numbers. Have yes. you noticed any efficiency concerns with plugging that into a solver? Uh, uh, right now, uh, we didn't see any, any issues with that. But uh, if we try to do really, really, really huge computations, maybe we could have some problems. We could uh, maybe create uh, uh, our own type we over the integers uh, and have an invariant on that type saying that they're all greater than 0, but uh, greater or equal than 0. but as of now, we haven't found any issues whatsoever. Yes. Other questions? <coughs> Since you seem to be fiddling around with the fuel, have yes. you considered using a delay monad instead of fuel? So say, say again, sorry. Have you considered using a delay monad instead of fuel? Uh, uh, using a what? A, a delay monad. Uh, a delay monad. No, I, I did not. I, I did not consider that. Uh, I haven't. So, uh, but probably. Save you from having to reason with arithmetic on fuel. Yes. Uh, but, uh, we, we haven't thought about it, but maybe we could, we could try to, to do something about that. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, and next up is Joao uh, Santos Reis. Oh, great. Uh, talking about a framework for static analysis and automatic verification of Tezos contracts. So, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is João. Uh, and it was just announced. I'll be talking about the, the another work of the Fresco project, which is formal verification of Tezos smart contracts. Uh, so, as we all know smart contracts have uh, an execution time and storage space control mechanism uh, through a feed that is gas. Uh, gas consumption can also result in fees that uh, will be debit from the smart contract balance. Uh, 
and when the execution of a smart contract depletes the defined gas limit, then the execution terminates abruptly. Uh, in order to prevent this failure, the developers of smart contracts <coughs> usually uh, just deploy the smart contracts with a uh, highly estimated gas limit so that uh, probably doesn't uh, ever run out of gas. Uh, however, uh, when one defines a high gas limit to a smart contract, that may result in uh, undesired fees due to uh, unpredictable behaviors that uh, were not supposed to happen uh, when the, the, initial, the initial planning of the smart contract. Uh, so, there are recent cases of bugs in smart contracts that led to losses of millions of dollars worth of assets, and uh, smart contracts are embedded in transactions, and transactions are immutable, so smart contracts can't be updated or patched. Uh, so there's been all this increasing interest in providing tools and mechanisms that guarantee or potentiate the correctness of smart contracts. So, uh, the goal of this work is to, uh, in an abstract way, research methods and techniques to statically analyze and verify the behavior and properties of smart contracts in respect to resource usage. Uh, more concretely, develop a framework to statically infer certain properties and behaviors of, smart, of Tesla smart contracts that can be automatically verified by any consumer of that smart contract. Uh, so, how are you going to do this? Uh, we have a three phase process for this. Uh, in the first phase, we'll develop a, a smart contract analysis framework. Uh, in the second phase, we will develop a, a, a mechanism to generate uh, verifiable certificates of uh, a smart contract property. And in the ultimate phase, we'll design and uh, instrumentalize all the, all the process of uh, generating and verifying these certificates. Also, we intend to uh, study the impact of uh, such a mechanism on the, the blockchain governance and control model. Uh, here we have a general overview of the of all the process we i'll talk in detail of each of these of these phases next so uh, uh we can actually can divide the, the process in two main phases uh one is the the, the analysis framework and the second is the the generation of and verification of uh, the, the certificates. So, in this first phase, we, we aim at a principled and generalized resource analysis framework for Tesla smart contracts. Uh, we pretend to reach this goal with a concrete case study, which is the gas consumption uh, analysis, uh, which might be composed of, eventually, different resource analysis. Uh, to facilitate develop the development and application of uh, these of different state-of-the-art techniques that already exist, uh, we are uh, usually these techniques target uh, uh, other kinds of languages that are not Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen, <laughs> as you know, is a stack-based language, etc., etc. So we intend to develop uh, an intermediate representation that eases the adoption of these existing <laughs> techniques. Uh, Having this, uh, this uh, analysis framework for uh, smart contracts, we intend to generate the, the very file certificates through uh, abstraction carrying code, uh, in which one uh, extracts, um, uh, given a certain safety policy, let's say a uh, smart contract runs under a certain gas limit threshold, okay? So given that safety policy, one extracts uh, an abstraction from, the, from a smart contract, uh, a series of verification conditions, which can only be proved if the execution of the smart contract does not violate the, the defined safety policy. And then if the safety policy holds, then the, the abstraction is considered to be a certificate of that property. Uh, given this, uh, the issuer of that certificate then 
sends the abstraction to the to the consumer and says that uh, uh, that certificate uh, means that the, the smart contract holds some property against the a certain policy. Uh, the consumer uh, having that certificate, the abstraction, should then generate again a, a verification condition according to a safety policy, which can be the same or some other variation of the, 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 the issuer policy. And uh, e the, the consumer should verify that the condition holds against the, the supplied uh, abstraction. If so, then the consumer might uh, consider that the smart contract execution does not violate the security policy. Uh, well, from this, uh, it results uh, in a two-way assurance to the, to the developer of the smart contract. Uh, there is a reassurance that the implementation of the smart contract uh, works as intended. Uh, to a consumer of the smart contract, uh, as you know, the smart contracts may come from uh, some untrust source, from a non-source, so there are values at stake and it's highly desired that the smart contract is able to prove that it respects some kind of policy, some kind of safety that uh, the consumer expects it to have. So uh, this work introduces a mechanism to do so. And in this case, we might, consi we might consider the, the consumer as, for example, the, the nodes that execute the smart contract, but also the, the users that interact with the, with the smart contract. Uh, on uh, the ultimate phase, we should design and assemble all the different components of this framework. Uh, we intend to optimize the verification process so that it should be performed on-chain. So the objective is to have an on-chain verifier <coughs> of, that, of smart contracts that you can supply the, the, the smart contract and the, 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 the safety policy and then uh, the on-chain it would say that the smart contract is or is not uh, verified. Uh, some interesting case study, for example, would be uh, the, the, verif the, the verifier smart contract to verify himself, uh, itself, okay? Uh, Having such a mechanism uh, gives uh, room to being able to determine gas consumption bounds and it opens doors for new economical and governance needs. For example, uh, one can uh, change the rules of the blockchain to refuse a smart contract that does not uh, respect center properties. So the impact of mechanism like the one proposed in this work are also relevant research point. Uh, as a current work, we have Tesla, Tesla is an intermediate representation of Mikkelsen. Um, it's a language that uses a, a store instead of a stack that intends to preserve all the semantic information that is present in the original Mikkelsen program. So uh, one might say it's uh, not too far from uh, Albert. Okay? Um, although the, they have uh, different goals. Uh, this representation enables easier adoption of existing frameworks or analysis, such as SoftCheck. What is SoftCheck? SoftCheck is a modular framework that I developed during my master thesis. That is a modular framework for static analysis with generalized language and analysis input. Uh, in, a, in a brief way, so you provide to the framework and <coughs> you define a generic analysis uh, template, then you'll um, you'll you'll instantiate a template of the intermediate language that the platform <coughs> accepts according to the language you want to support. Uh, you define the, uh, then a series of specific uh, uh, language uh, components of the analysis, and then the the platform provides all the mechanism to generate contr control flow graphs. Uh, generating uh, constraints and verifying. Uh, so, as such, we have developed, we have written uh, SIL semantics. SIL is the intermediate intermediate language that the soft check accepts. Uh, 
it's, this is a continuation style, the notational semantics, and enables the definition of uh, analysis correct by construction. Uh, Tesla, as I said, is an uh, uh, intersection between Michelson and Seal. Uh, Tesla is a representation of Michelson, potentially supported uh, by the subject framework, and the current version contemplates most of Michelson instruction. So it has a mechanism to convert stack usage to variables usage, and uh, as a further work, uh, we need to express Michelson in its completeness, verify that it preserves gas consumption information, and define a formal semantics with a well-defined gas consumption model. Uh, here we have an example of a Michelson, pro a Michelson program in Tesla. Uh, Tesla actually doesn't have a concrete syntax. This is a, uh, a syntax that I made up for this presentation, so it would be nicer the, to show than the abstract data type. Uh, this is a simple contract where uh, it has some loops, but actually what it does is it returns the, the it as a parameter that is a list string and actually it sends back the, that parameter. So if you see here, uh, let's say the this is the, the pair of uh, the parameter and storage. It's it's value is stored in x1, and uh, if x1 is empty, then x4 is the the, the empty list. Uh, if not, x4 is x1. That is the parameter, and it returns the. Uh, X4 as uh, the parameter or the empty, st the empty list, but uh, only in the case where the parameter is actually empty. Uh, why do we want to use subject? Uh, by using subject, we obtain with minimal effort, as I said, all the control flow graph generation part of the process and uh, generation and verification of constraints. Uh, so we will do this by Let's say we have a Michelson program, then we just convert it to Tesla. Tesla will then be supported by the SoftCheck platform, and we have all the tools uh, needed to write and execute analysis. Uh, so as next steps, we intend to evaluate the control flow graph generation of Tesla represented programs, implement a prototype of a gas consumption analysis, and uh, next, we'll then integrate this analysis prototype into SoftCheck and adapt SoftCheck and the analysis to upset interpretation in order to then uh, get to the point of generating the certificates. So, with this work, we obtain a principled framework for resource analysis of Tezo smart contracts with a certificate extraction and verification mechanism. Re research and develop analysis mechanisms for smart contract resource analysis, uh, an architecture for on-chain verification process, and enable new rules as one can now infer a uh, sound upper bound of gas consumptions. Uh, here are some links of uh, both mine and my colleagues' work. And thank you for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> questions? All right, thanks again. Okay. So we're having a 10 minutes break. 10 minutes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.
is going to prove that this state is not reachable for the splitter for any number of uh, processes. Okay? Uh, how does it uh, how does it work? So very quickly, uh, MCMT is a combination of a backward reachability algorithm plus an SMT solver that uses an SMT solver. And uh, everything here is about logic, actually, uh, because uh, this uh, transition system is just uh, a, 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 a set of formulas. For instance, um, transitions are just formula that uh, make a relation between the value of the variable x, y, p, c and the value of the variable after one step. So x, y, uh, x prime, y prime, and p, c prime. So for instance, uh, this kind of formula, uh, uh, for all x, y, and p, c, x prime, uh, y prime, p, c prime, there exists a process p such that p, c, p is p, c, zero, and x prime is p, and y prime is y, and p, c prime is p, c, where p is assigned to p, c, one. So this formula corresponds to this transition. And formula to be proved, okay, unsafe formula, um, are, uh, have, have these forms. Uh, these formulas are existentially quantified formula. Uh, if there exists P and Q such that, uh, and if P is distinct than Q, then PC of P is stop and PC of Q is stop. So that's the formula uh, that describes a set of states, and we want to be sure that states described by this formula are not reachable. And these formula are called cubes. Okay, and this is a, a, a very simple and uh, common uh, backward reachability algorithm, except that states are described using formulas. Okay, so and you want just to yes to, to know if some bad state uh, uh, is reachable or not. So basically, you have a universally quantified formula that describes initial states, again for all p blah blah. And uh, you have an unsafe formula, so Q that describes bad states, and you have your transition system that are uh, described using this kind of formulas. So, as usual, you have a set V of visited states, because states are formulas, V is going to be a set of formulas. And you have some data structure to, uh, to, uh, um, to, 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 to run the, 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 the backward reachability. So, for instance, a Q, uh, let's say. So, you can push the initial formula in Q, and you have this, uh, this uh, while uh, loop that says, uh, while Q is not empty, then you pop a formula. You pop a value from Q. So phi is a formula which describes bad states. So first, you check if these states intersect with the initial state <coughs> using just uh, an SMT solver. So you just send the formula phi and i to the SMT. If it is satisfiable, then uh, the, 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 the problem is unsafe, or the, the states are reachable. Otherwise, you have a fixed point check, which consists just to, to check if phi implies the disjunction of uh, the, uh, well, uh, imply, uh, contains uh, new states or not. And for that, you just want to know if phi implies the disjunction of the states uh, visited. So if this is not true, if phi does not imply the disjunction uh, of uh, these states, then you add it to V, to v and you compute the pre-image of this formula according to the transition system. And uh, it gives you actually a set of, uh, uh, of cubes. And these cubes, you push them in Q and so on. Uh, now, what uh, this talk is about is about this. We had. Uh, we had these two uh, the, these properties at most n minus one processes and in down or right. In order to express this formula, you need uh, a universally quantified <coughs> formula. You need to say for all p, p c of p is down is an uns is a bad state. Okay, this is what we want to add to cubical. Uh, more uh, generally, uh, the kind of formula we, we, we are uh, interested in are a mix of um, our formula with a prefix of existentially uh, um, quantifier and a universally quantifier. So this is uh, this kind of formula. So that's an extension of cubes. So there exists some process p uh, i, sorry, and for all k vector k, uh, then uh, some uh, some uh, some conjunction of literals. This is more expressive, and basically this kind of uh, formula can express global termination uh, conditions. For instance, in some consensus, you want to say at the end of uh, the consensus, or so when uh, every process, for all process, they have, uh, they have reached some, some, some location, then blah, blah. Then this is not possible. That's 
so on. And so this is exactly what this kind of formula can express, a global termination uh, condition that cannot be expressed using an existentially quantified formula. Uh, bad news. MCMT for universal cubes uh, cannot be fully automated. That's a well-known result. And, uh, and there exist some solutions. And in cubicle, we tr of course, we have, uh, we have implemented uh, in the past uh, a solution for that. Basically, they are all based on over-approximation. But, but sometimes, and actually uh, very often, this uh, result in false uh, positives. <coughs> so, uh, so we try something new. Okay, in order to to uh, to uh, to, uh, to prove well, try to prove this kind of formula, and this is what my talk is about. So just well, I will skip this one. Just that was a slide to say uh, why this is uh, this is non-terminating when you have this kind of cubes. So what we have designed is the following: we have extended the backward reachability algorithm of cubicle. Uh, to reason about universal cubes, and we have uh, connected actually the backward reachability algorithm uh, with a weakest precondition calculus. So what I'm going to present is a tight cooperation between uh, these uh, this two algorithms of, let's say, cubicle and my tree. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I will present this tight cooperation, and so, as I said, we use a deductive verification engine for, for this uh, cooperation, and this is, uh, this is y tree. Which I should say, of course. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, okay. So le le I would just present, uh, I hope, very s in a simple way, uh, the, the main idea. So that's a three-step approach. So first, what we do, we fix a finite domain. So you want to prove f uh, in the, in the in the splitter that for all p, p c of p uh, is down is a bad state. Fix the cardinality of uh, the, 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 the type proc. Let's say three. So in that case, there is no problem. Okay, the for all <coughs> formula is just a finite uh, conjunction. So if there are only three processes, then the formula is PC of H1, which is uh, the name of the first process, is down, and PC of two is down, and PC of H3 is down. This is okay. This is finite. Then you can run cubicle on this finite property. You run the backward reachability of cubicle using SMT and so on. Of course, if the backward reachability said that this finite uh, formula is uh, describes bad state, of course, this is OK. Uh, the, the whole problem is, is unsafe, so no problem. <coughs> Otherwise, we go to step two. And now in the step two, we're going to exploit the subset of, a subset of pre-images computed at step one. And we are going to try to generalize invariance to infinite domain. So what, the what is the point here? So you run cubicle. Uh, if, uh, if you reached a fixed point and there was no uh, safety problem, so you had a lot of cubes, but for a finite domain. And uh, the disjunction of these cubes is, uh, is, is, is an invariant of the system. And each of these cubes are also invariant of the system. Are they invariant for the universal case? Who knows? So for that, we try to generalize them. And we run again the backward reachability. So what we can do, we can construct cubes by replacing each process constant by an existentially uh, quantified variable. We run backward reachability. If it says safe, we keep it. Otherwise, we go to step three. In the step three, uh, 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 otherwise, what we can do, sorry, uh, we, can, we can actually we can generalize these cubes in a safe way. Uh, but we, uh, we, we have a mix of existentially and universally quantified variables. Uh, so I would give you an example. <coughs> so for instance, this is the first the formula. Okay? PC is down for uh, every uh, constant 1 and 2 and 3. If you do the pre-image of this formula using the SPL4 down transition, which just is the transition that assigned to down the, 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 the last process. So before this transition, the uh, process uh, H1 was in PC3, X was distinct than H3, H1, and the other one was in down. Okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's an invariant of the system. There is no problem. It is, uh, it's, it is for sure when there are only three processes. Unfortunately, if you abstract is, if each of these uh, uh, constants by an existentially quantified variable, and you try to prove it, this, this formula for an, an arbitrary number of processes, it is unsafe. So that's an invariant for a finite set of processes, but not for an infinite one. So what we can do, uh, because this generalization doesn't work, what we can do 
we can just abstract by an existentially quantified hash one, there exists P, and we can now uh, uh, contract the other processes by a for all formula for all Q, PC of uh, Q is down. Okay? And so we do this, this step two. So generalizing these cubes, okay, using these two kind of uh, generalization. And then we go to Y3. So what we can do, we have to translate the cubical program into Y3. And we take all the universal, uh, the, the cubes, generalize step two. And we send everything to Y3 and we see what happens. Okay? Uh, well, just to, 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 to show that, well, so what, what, what we finally, uh, uh, what, what we, we have done here, this is, that was the backward reachability. What, what we have done is just we have, you, you have we have, um, extended the, the backward reachability, which here is, is, is done for a, a, cons, uh, a fixed number of processes. So that's the same f uh, algorithm, except that it is for a finite uh, set of uh, processes. And at the end, we have the generalized uh, um, uh, stuff. Uh, so I am running late or not? Is it OK? Or OK. Uh, so, uh, of course, there are some, uh, some details uh, you have to, to do here. So, um, so generalization and filter, that's not very interesting. Well, basically, uh, for the universal generalization, so the, 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 this, uh, this step here, where we, 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 we just abstract some constant by existentially quantified variable and the other one by for all variable, a for all quantifier, well, in order to do that, well, we have to, 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 to hack a little bit in cubical, um, uh, some kind of um, dependency analysis. We, we, we want to know, basically, uh, w which variable is used in a transition. And if a variable is used in a transition, then we can, we can abstract it using a dis existentially quantified variable. If a, formula, if a variable is not used in some pre-images, then we can abstract it using a full uh, quantifier. So basically, that's the, the stuff that is described here. Um, now there is an important part, of course, which is the translation of cubicle, okay, array-based transition system to Y3. Uh, cubicle is uh, is done for concurrent program, uh, non-deterministic program uh, in finite uh, loops, and Y3 is done for deterministic program, uh, sequential program, in finite pro program. Okay, so that's the opposite. Uh, so we have to do some uh, some 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 trick here. So in order to well, to, to cope with the infinite execution and to know it with no determinism and also uh, to provide invariance to Y3. So I will, I prefer to now to, to show you a demo, okay? That maybe that will be uh, simpler. So uh, can you see that? That's okay. Okay. So, so, so that's the, the splitter, okay? That's the splitter. And uh, you can see that there is, this is this uh, universal and safe <laughs> formula. Okay. So, I'm going to run cubical, okay, with this unsafe, uh, uh, this uh, universal unsafe uh, stuff. So, and at the moment, what I, I'm just going to do, I'm going to run it for a fixed number of processes here. That's three, okay. So if I run it, what I get is this. So that's the the backward reachability uh, done by cubical. So you, I, as you, but you can uh, you can see the the original unsafe uh, formula, okay. So PCH1 is down and so on. And what I didn't uh, tell during this talk is that so cubicle is going to perform this backward reachability but actually cubicle has some kind of uh, 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 mechanism to infer invariance and this is the blue part here so for instance when you have this uh, this formula here while well, cubicle is going to over approximate this formula by this one in a safe way well, I try to do it in a safe way and here that's the was the case, and uh, and uh, that's also the, the, the case here. And so wh what is important using this uh, inference uh, mechanism of cubicle is that usually the invariant the, the, the invariant that we, we, we the over approximation that we we got during the, the backward reachability are sometimes and usually very interesting. So I said that we have to take this formula, this pre image, this one, this one, and so on, and to uh, generalize them. What we're going to do. We are just going to generalize this blue part because we are sure that they are the most important part of this backward reachability. So, if I uh, if I run uh, if I run now, I'm going to do the same thing. But now I'm going to generate a Y3 file. Okay, so that's going okay. So I'm going to show you the file. So that's the file 
that's the phi generated by cubicle, the y3 phi generated by cubicle. So trust me, that's well, we hope that the translation is correct. So we have we have some some stuff for the this kind, this problem of non-deterministic uh, um, uh, program, and we have uh, this this uh, this while loop with this. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this number where this variable next step and max step and so on to simulate infinite program forget about that the most important part is that is that uh, this so the rest of this file the rest of this file is the translation of the uh, transition system of, uh, of cubicle and now we have this invariance this invariance uh, and and this invariance are the, the blue part again this blue part or at the beginning invariance for a world with three processes, mm -hmm. and this blue part have been generalized using uh, the, 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 the way I, I just described. Now let's see if uh, if if Y three can can prove that. And so uh, <coughs> so I run Y three. So of course what I can do, well I'm sure you know the, the answer. Of course uh, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Otherwise that's uh, okay. So that's a lot uh, of stuff here. Okay, I, I have split it the the, the, uh, the the formula, and I, I run Altergo, and everything is cool, and we are done. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> um, so to conclude. So we have. So that's the uh, starting point of something. So we have now a way of trying to handle universal cubes in cubicle. <coughs> and uh, we know that these cubes are, are very mandatory for proving properties of that distributed system. I mean, where you need global termination condition, when you need to prove something about the consensus, and so on. Uh, so for that, we have extended this backward reachability and, uh, and, and, and connected uh, it to, to a, a workspace precondition calculus. As a future work, what we plan to do is to design a, um, actually a, a, a Y3 for cubicle, okay? uh, in the sense that uh, we, we, we need to, uh, to, to, to have more, um, how to say that, I don't know, but we, we, we need to design our own double, uh, WP calculus. Because in all that stuff, uh, the, the, the shape of the formula that you are generating is very important. And so it's much better to design the WP calculus for uh, the array-based transition system than using this uh, translation to Y3. Uh, so we, we plan to do that, but after that, of course, our, 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 um, our, w our WP calculus is going to use Y3, but the logical part of Y3 in order to, uh, of course, to, 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 to run uh, the zero uh, SMT solver and so on. But basically, designing our own WP calculus, if we have that, we know that now we, we can also go a step uh, 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 that consists in a, a, a more a tight cooperation between the WP calculus and, and cubicle. For instance, what happens when you send something to, to the, the, the WP calculus and it fails to, to prove the formula? Okay, well, at the moment, uh, it's nothing. I mean, you cannot uh, get something from uh, Y3. But we plan to get something from Y3 uh, to have uh, this kind of a complete uh, rounding trip loop. That's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, can you go back? The example, please. I don't think it's possible. Is that? No, the, the example you did in the library. Uh, the cubicle file? Uh, the fixed number of processes. I just want to. Ah, okay. You mean when I run cubicle? Yeah, the top. Okay, okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you want to show that? This is what you want to... Yes, okay. So I don't understand. You abstract uh, into this invariant. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then you seek to concretize again from uh, an abstract state, which must provide some false positive here, I guess. There is no false... I mean, uh, so <laughs> the, the, this, the, this state has been abstracted by this one, as you can see in a very uh, easy way since you just uh, forget about this uh, PCS3, <coughs> PC3 and, uh, and that's it. And so this has been abstracted to that. And, and actually, thi thi this abstraction was a good one, yes. okay, because uh, uh, the tree is uh, closed. And then to continue your analysis, you need to reconcretize, yes, this abstracted. 
No, 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 absolutely. No, no, no. Th this state is as concrete as this one, and this state you just compute, compute the pre-image of this state and so on. Or uh, this one, the, the, this one, or pre-image of this one of this state using this uh, SPL2 uh, formula using hash3, the SPL1 formula using hash3, and so on. So this, these states are pre-images of this one, and this one are immediately discharged. Okay, which means that this state does not provide any uh, something uh, new. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. So for instance, uh, as you can see, that's very simple. This one is subsumed by this one just because this one describes states that are definitely described by this formula. Hmm. So, so, so that means that this abstraction was, uh, was a good one. Okay? And that's the goal, actually, of ma the main goal of, uh, of the model shaker. Well, when you have a formula, at the beginning it is, let's say, clean. Okay? It, it is uh, exactly what you want to prove. But when you compute the pre-image, this formula is going to contain a lot of stuff. I mean, you're going to, to get everything about the requirement of a transition. Some part of the requirement of the transition are very important, of course. But some part are just administrative stuff. And you want to, to basically, you want to remove this administrative stuff to go on. Basically, that's what we are doing here. Yes, yes, of course. And, and, and so, yeah, so this algorithm actually uh, is a, is a back, uh, so th this algorithm behind this uh, invariance mechanism is called BRAB. So that's backward, backward reachability uh, with approximation and backtracking. So basically, we try, we try to uh, over approximate, and then if something goes wrong, then we backtrack. And we try other over approximate. And that's not complete, of course. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just be, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, to be more precise, if three doesn't work out, what doesn't work out, do you try to use five four? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but to, okay, to be more precise, I should say something. I should say that when, when you design the splitter, so I'm not, I'm not Lamport, <laughs> but when Lamport designed the splitter, so you design a such an algorithm. How much processes do you have in mind when you design it? You, you see what I mean? You don't have uh, 15 processes, okay? Presumably, you have in mind three or four processes when you have designed this, this, this protocol. Of course, there is a proof to be that has to be done to show that this algorithm works for an, an arbitrary number of processes. But the, the point is that maybe that's the case that if you have designed this process, this algorithm for three, you can be sure that you have covered a lot of things using three. And that's what we are doing. <laughs> but but I, I don't know if Lamport, uh, how many processes Lamport has used to, uh, to, to, to think about the splitter. But, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alors, attends. C'est toujours vert. Okay. Uh, so uh, this talk uh, <laughs> disclaimer: there's no verification inside. Uh, now uh, the title of this workshop is Tedo Smart Contract Programming Language and Formal Verification, and I optimistically t uh, understand that this "and" is an enumeration, not conjunction. Okay. Uh, so what is SCaml? I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, but this is yet another OCaml compiler to Mike Wilson. And the uh, moti first motivation of this SCaml compiler is, well, I tried to write Michelson by hand, but uh, I found it's really hard at first. So uh, naturally, you know, if you are a compiler, you know, if you, if you are uh, you know, the researcher of compiler, then naturally you start to write a compiler to Michelson. So I wrote it, then I, well, it's pretty sm small since it's just for myself at first. So it's for, so, but, 
and it's only 3,000 lines, and it works for uh, all, most of all the opcodes. So, yeah, it's uh, started from some kind of toy project, but it's no longer a toy, a kind of serious project. We can actually write the uh, uh, various program using SCAM. So, S what's S? You know? S is maybe a smart contract, or, yeah, actually, SCAM is a, as a language, it's a strict subset of OCAM, so it's S, and a small and serious, okay? Or maybe you can call it a smart contract abstract machine language or something like that. Okay, so it's a strict <coughs> subset of OCaml. Uh, it's a, yeah, yeah. This is a lightning talk, so let me do it quick, pretty you know, quickly. So there's no fancy features, no, 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 no fancy syntax or no fancy typing about Michael's on no smart contract at all. So and a uh, lot of many, a you know, lot of features, OCaml features are just not available. No recursion, no polymorphism, no modules, no objects, no mutability, and uh, even no user-defined types. It, SCAM currently only supports the basic types of Michelson, list, option, map, and uh, sum, and, and pair. Okay. And it's really small, since uh, it's built over OCaml's compiler li library. So I, I just uh, no, uh, use whatever I can use. Or, you know, and, uh, so, uh, <coughs> so the uh, programs are just passed by original OCAM parser and the type checked by original OCAM type checker. So this is well, really well tested. Of course, there's no certification, but uh, I'm sure uh, Jack will prove all the correctness pretty soon. Okay, and uh, so what actually SCAM does no, is just to translate this typed AST of OCAM to Michelson. And uh, it just consists of 3,000 lines and uh, I, I finished it in five days. <coughs> and uh, well, in, in addition, these 3,000 lines, uh, I think 20% of these 3,000 lines are just to reject uh, these excessive features you know, and uh, pro politely inform users that, sorry, SCAM don't support recursion. OK, and it's serious. Yeah, at first it was a uh, toy, but uh, I could make, uh, I, I managed to support all the opcodes instead of create contract, which requires some complications. And uh, I, since it's compiled down to a uh, pure, no, uh, no side effect uh, ML, so I can do, well, trivial optimization, optimizations, and I also supported uh, Babylon features such as entry points and the closures. Okay. So to be the benefit of being strict subset is well almost apparent. So if you are uh, mo most of in, uh, most of people in this room should write OCaml programs, which means that you can immediately start writing uh, my uh, Tezos smart contract using SCAM since it's a strict subset and uh, there's no surprise, no no strange features. And the newbies. I can. I, I don't need to write any, you know, introductory uh, article of SCAM. Uh, no. Instead, I can just uh, hand over some good OCaml book like Real World OCaml and uh, just ask them uh, learn, learn OCaml and come back later. Okay. And uh, most importantly, uh, since it's just strict subset of OCaml, <coughs> so we can use uh, many existing OCaml ecosystem tools for free. For example, Marlin, Twaleg. Uh, indenta and the reformatter, and we can even use PPXP4. I don't like ReasonML, but uh, well, why not? We can use ReasonML. So it's really, uh, you know, with minimum effort, we can uh, do a lot of things. Okay? And uh, even more, it's just an idea, but uh, for example, we can compile <coughs> these smart contracts to native code using genuine OCaml. Uh, compiler. If we, we write, we, if we prepare some uh, OCaml library to emulate Michelson uh, primitives, so this can lead to uh, some kind of simulation, fast simulation of smart contract, uh, which well usually, well I ha I, ha I had a small some some experience in a uh, uh, contract simulation in uh, financial field. I mean uh, derivative modeling. So, well, currently, I, I don't think uh, we have so complex contract in Tezos, but uh, we, 
in future, I mean, wh why not? We can, we can run some Monte Carlo simulation over Tezos contract. <coughs> and uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Peter has uh, mentioned about it, but uh, uh, let me rephrase. Yeah, we can also uh, write uh, many layers of softwares uh, in one language, OCaml, for example, uh, contract and the UI and the server code. You know? And uh, these all three codes are compiled by different compilers to Michelson or J JavaScript or native code. Okay? It's just like oxygen for Tezos. And the compilation path is very simple, just to parse it and type, in, type it by an OCaml genuine compiler. And after that, since uh, Michelson com contract functions have some uh, specific type criteria and uh, typing, I mean, a function which takes a, a parameter and a storage and return a list of operation and a new, st new storage. So I can, yeah, uh, do some additional type unification over uh, type, uh, type to ASD of OCaml. After that, it's, it's pretty simple. Just a trans translate down to a pure monomorphic core ML, rejecting uh, excessive features, and then, uh, well, some optimization. And after that, it's quite straightforward compilation from Lambda calculus to stack-based machines. OK, so it's, it's fucking simple OCaml. No. And even, for, for example, well, I, so in, in SCaml, we have several uh, numeric types. And as, as OCaml does, SCaml have more than one arithmetic operator, so no overall. And so, and uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, currently, it only supports pair and sum. There's no uh, user-defined types, but uh, still, we can uh, define aliases. OK, uh, future work. Uh, well, I, I don't want to make it ultra super complex, you know, secure language. It's my, my goal is make it or keep it simple. You know? So just, uh, well, currently, I'm writing pattern much, and it's almost done this morning. And also adding, uh, probably, I. Yeah, I'm going to add some user-defined types. OK, and uh, well, if, if I have to add some kind of verification test to my presentation, maybe it's, it's completely wild idea. But I can maybe, you know, since I'm working with uh, the FX <coughs> team, since we, our, our offices are quite, quite near, so uh, probably you know, ReFX is a, a refinement type over Michelson, but uh, maybe Combining their effort with SCAMO, maybe we can uh, build somehow uh, SCAMO plus refinement type. No? Adding some res uh, refinement specification in SCAMO source code as annotations. And as if SCAMO, SCAMO compiler can uh, propagate these annotations to Michelson, then we can use VFX, VFX's uh, yeah, verification for that, uh, for smart contracts. OK, that's uh, my, my SCAM compiler, or SCAM language. No? <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's all. Thanks. If anybody has a question. Yep. Uh, yeah, can you compile like with lexical scope, so closures, and how do you encode those in Lambda? Uh, oh, in, in Babylon, we can uh, make uh, closures easily, yeah. So there's no problem. Yeah, it supports closures. And uh, even in Athens, I, I have made some uh, uh, closure encoding uh, using some weird typing techniques. But, uh, you know, after I have finished this work, you know, a few days later, you know, Babylon updates was published or announced. And uh, I, I saw the announcement, and I said, "Fuck!" No? <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's no 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 currently there's no problem to have uh, closures at all. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks. And next, we will be having blockchains as fancy distributed spreadsheets by Colin Gonzalez. OK, hi. So my name is Colin Gonzalez. And I'm a doctorate student since two months ago. 
uh, another the supervision of Maja Makanu from Nomadic Labs and Yann Rijenas from uh, the IRIF, uh, the University of Paris. So today I will talk about uh, a different approach to writing smart contracts. So often we stumble upon this Michelson and we think that it's somewhat uneasy to have to handle uh, um, the stack based computation system and even for skilled programmers it can be somewhat inconvenient. So we're looking for a different programming technique that would enjoy intuitive semantics to, uh, to minimize the risk of errors, but as well allow to track the execution on the, uh, of a contract in a blockchain and be known, be friendly to many users. And of course, be adapted to static analysis and mechanized proofs. So we thought, why not use spreadsheets? Spreadsheets is the most popular programming language, and it's already used by people that should write contracts. Um, spreadsheets are an intuitive format to simulate executions of a large class of contracts. Perhaps not all, but a large one. <coughs> uh, spreadsheets is extensible. Only writing plugins, we can change the behavior of, smart, of, of spreadsheets. and add uh, features to write, simulate, publish, and track smart contracts on the blockchain. And as well, spreadsheets somehow can be seen as functional programs, a class of programs that are reasoning, that are adapted to reasoning st uh, and static analysis. So here's an example of what how we imagine encoding a, a smart contract in a spreadsheet. Um, here is a storage. Here is the calls, which are the transfers to the smart contract. And here are the issued operations and the balance. So we need to make the, the, these sections of the smart contract uh, explicit to ease the process of compilation. But in fact, all what that we're saying is that we're making computations from, uh, from the calls to the operations. And perhaps we have some uh, intermediate computations. Here we, we have hidden them. But essentially, this is our contract. And w which is great is that once we have defined uh, how we want to compute the operation from the calls, we only have to pull down the formula down the bottom of the list, uh, and the sheet. And this is what we call the pull down programming, which is very familiar to many Excel users or other spreadsheets. And this is what we want to exploit. <coughs> so the great question is, can we compile a spreadsheet into Michelson? And of course, yes, we can. In ESOP 2019, Yann Reginas and his co-author have shown a novel method to compute derivative of a functional program, so which is for all function b uh, of type arrow to uh, of type a arrow b, uh, we have the derivative being of type a arrow delta a arrow delta b, where uh, delta a and delta b are the, the changes over a and respectively over b. And we say that f of x uh, with the changes of dx equals to f of x uh, with the changes of the derivative of x of f over uh, of x and dx. And so uh, a spreadsheet defines a function from a list to calls, uh, uh, from a list of calls to a list of operations. So the underlying contract is simply an incrementalization of, of f which is the derivative of f. And this is what we plan to do to produce the, the, the smart contract. Um, however, not all programs can be represented easily. For instance, we have a contract that represents uh, an investor uh, that is depositing money. And we, we want to, at some point, the MVC wants to withdraw the money. So here is depositing money. The MVC recovers the whole sum. And uh, whenever he has made some profit, he deposits the money, and he makes several operations to redistribute the money. But the problem that we have is that if we want to reuse this program, um, uh, we, we, can, we have troubles expressing looping, uh, looping contracts. So this is perhaps one limitation. But we, we are looking to, to see how much spreadsheet can we represent without imposing a different uh, method of programming on spreadsheets that is not jo jeopardizing the accessibility of spreadsheets. So here, this is my, my presentation. Thank you.
All right, are there any questions? Super interesting. All right, and anything else? All right, let's thank the speaker. And next, we will have smart tie, smart types for smart contract validation. OK, thank you. So let me check. I understand how this works. OK. Right, so uh, yesterday, if you were here and uh, you attended Peter's talk, he, talk, he introduced a bit of, sma of uh, 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 behavioral types. And this talk is on the, the use of behavioral types to express and validate uh, uh, smart contracts. <coughs> Starting from this idea that uh, uh, smart contracts are really a description of complex protocols. And we want basically also to understand the relationship between the states and the transitions and to be sure that every transition your program uh, uh, takes actually is following the high level con uh, protocol that expresses the, the contract. So you have two views, two views of uh, uh, the, the contract. One is the high level protocol and another one is the code you're actually running and you need to, con to make them, uh, uh, to conciliate them. And there are already uh, tools to, these, to do this in uh, uh, FSolid is a, a, a well-known tool to, to do this, but the difficulty I, I find is that there is a, a, a need to actually provide constructs, to actually provide uh, uh, programming features to deal with this at the level of uh, uh, code development, at the language level, uh, uh, to do this at compile time and not offline or afterwards in, in, in with difficult connections to, to, to the code. And uh, moreover, there is this notion of type state that actually connects uh, uh, the idea of protocol to the, uh, to the states of, the pro of, the, uh, of a program. And many times in, in these approaches like uh, uh, F-Solid or, or, or Flint, the consequence is that the protocols are fragmented. You, you just, when you just look into the states, preconditions and postconditions, you're chopping your protocol horizontally and somehow you lose all th this uh, uh, idea of executing it and f understanding what are the paths that is actually valid and what should happen. So also in the consensus protocols we have basically again protocols with several participants. Again we need to be sure that the several phases are followed by every participant and again you can express this as for instance uh, uh, we've seen Sylvan doing as uh, um, a label transition system or uh, so this clear representation of the protocol as an abstraction of, of, of behavior. So the proposal uh, uh, I'm developing is to do uh, this in three ways by, uh, and conciliate these three ways. One is synthesis. So the developer somehow writes the abstraction, maybe like an automaton, and gets by some, with the help of some tool, a template of code, some, some, some code that is surely it will follow the protocol he wrote as an automaton, but lacks a lot of details. And then the program fills in the details from the, uh, the, um, the automaton. Another approach is to infer the abstraction from the code. You write the code and statically infer the, the, the automaton. And then when you look at, at it, you, you check if it is actually what you want to do or if there are paths so there are possible executions that should not be there, and you go back to the code and change it. 
And the third one is, a, is to write both things, the code and the automaton, and type check, <laughs> and just use type checking. So this example, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want just to, to, to present the code in detail. I want to present three times this slide. The first is, you start here on the right. You define your protocol as an automaton, right? There are some details, many details left out. But and from this code, from this, code this protocol, checking. this automaton, you produce some code automatically, the code and then the you go over it and, and, and fill in details that are, are, are needed. And, and, this, uh, and then you're sure that uh, uh, the, the code is following this protocol. You can have a type checker ensuring this. But then you have a problem that you can see here, because here you have some action, like collect, but when you start writing the code and, and refining it, maybe you said, well, I want to collect last and the collect one, and now I need to go back to the automaton and change it again, and so you, there is this iterative process, but it helps the developer because he starts here, he gets code, refines the code, gets back the type, and, and uh, changes again the type, and, and goes over. But the second approach to this, so this was the first approach, just synthesize. The second approach is that you start here. You write the code with all pre and post conditions. This looks like type state approach. And from the pre and post conditions, you, you, you just start analyzing what, imply, what post conditions imply which preconditions, and you get an automaton. So you can infer from here this, uh, this representation. Well, not exactly this, because now this would be uh, correct with respect to the code you have, but this is the, inf the inference approach. You, you, you write the code, you need to fully annotate it with pre-post conditions and some invariants, and then you extract the automaton and you look at it and say, okay, it looks like what I want to, to do. There are no sequence of executions that will be bizarre or that will be unsafe. And the third the third way of looking at this slide is to say you do both at the same time. You write the code, you don't need the preconditions. You write the, the, the automaton and you just type checking. And the, 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 to do type checking, basically, you follow the automaton and you check that each method behaves according to it and you check that it leaves the program in a state where the next state the, is possible. And these three approaches, they are available in this community of uh, uh, um, behavioral types. You, there, are a pro there are tools for specific languages to do this, uh, th but each one does it independently. And I think it's not difficult to put them all together and provide this uh, a, a new tool to a dedicated language. I, I s in this uh, uh, couple of days, I've heard of several. Arf, uh, uh, S, Camel, uh, uh, Refex. We can take one of those languages or make uh, 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 a fusion of, of a few of them and try these ideas. And so uh, uh, to sum up, the idea is to, well, extract the behavioral descriptions from the code. This is just type inference or uh, um, do the, 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 the synthesis of the code, or do the type checking. Of course, we need to think about resource usage. And we heard about refinement types. Uh, we thought about the, uh, dependent types, or even connect uh, to, to produce assertions that would need to be uh, proven offline, uh, would proven outside in Y3 to produce a thir assertions that you submit to, uh, directly to a solver or you submit to Y3 and with the help of Y3 you get them done. So here I'm not fully sure that only with a fully static approach you can do everything you want to do with, with, with the smart contracts. But basically, once you have the, 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 the type abstraction of the behavior you want for the program and the code, you can change them both and just do type checking. This is the, the approach. Okay.
So, what we want to, to actually ensure? Protocol correctness, because all, function co all calls will follow the protocol. Functional correct correctness, uh, I'm so sorry for the typo, could be like discharging into, into cubicle, could, could be using dependent type, could be doing both, right? And resource usage correctness. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop here because it's just a lightning bolt. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? Um, I just have one question. Oh, so please. this is, what, what exactly is the class of automaton that you would support on the graphical side? Right. So uh, behavioral types are actually context-free. You can express them as context-free uh, grammars. Mm -hmm. And so there, <coughs> the, there are several approaches to, to, to them and depends exactly on the, uh, the kind of uh, properties you want to express. Uh, but I think the, easy, the, the, um, the most popular approach is to use something like regular lang languages, finite automaton. <coughs> but for some applications, you need uh, uh, um, a context-free grammar. And so, but the, here you have this, the typical the, the standard relationship. You have behavior of the program and, and, and understand if that's what you want. Uh, and uh, the term, the, 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 the regular expression, for instance, is also is handy to use as a type and to submit to a type checker. Mm -hmm. So the, these uh, uh, both views, the, 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 this ability of going from one to the other automatically is also quite interesting here, I think. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'll, I'll just go to you talking. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hello? All right, um, if you could pull up the slides. Uh, yes. All right, uh, and next we will have concert, a smart contract verification framework in COC. And so I should say, speaker is Bass Spitters. Uh, I should say I've been enjoying the workshop. I've been following it via YouTube. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the uh, Concordia Foundation. It's it's a project sort of similar to uh, to Tesos. So there's a foundation and also a, a company related to it, like you have for Nomadic Labs. Um, so we have a big research center in uh, in Aarhus at Aarhus University, and it's free and open science. So we're very open to collaboration, and we're having uh, good contacts with the uh, with the Tesos developers in the Tesos community. Um, the focus is somewhat more on business applications than in Tesos, I think. If you want to have a, a quick comparison. Um, so what I want to uh, tell you about is uh, a language we've been developing. So this is a, a very core uh, smart contract language and is very much in the style of, uh, like a number of languages we've seen before. Uh, we've embedded this language into Cock and that's the main thing I wanted to tell you about. So we've isolated Lambda Smart, so it's basically system F with inductive types and recursion. So you allow unbounded recursion. So it's uh, it's the core language for the Concordia blockchain, but I don't think it's very different for, for from example, the uh, 
or Camelico or the um, S-Camel that we've seen before. Uh, so the technology that we've, we've been developing should also be available for these other languages. So the observation is that COC actually comes with a, a built-in functional language and COC's type system is very expressive. So it allows us to write both the programs in our specifications. Now what we want to do is to reason both about the smart contract language itself, the meta properties, but at the same time reason about individual smart contracts. Uh, so what we're going to do is there's a new extension to COC, which is called MetaCOC, which is, allows us to do meta programming in the COC system. And we embed uh, this Lambda Smart into COC uh, by just translating the AST to, um, to the AST of COC. Um, but our approach is also suitable for other functional smart, contract, uh, smart contracts. So I think we've heard about Camoligo and um, Camel before. It will also work for Simplicity, for Plus, and for Sophia, there's some others. So about MetaCOC, uh, so this adds meta programming facilities to COC, so it's like quoting and non-quoting that you're familiar with from other languages. And it's it allows COC to be its own tactic language. Uh, as you know, the LTAC language, it, it can use some upgrades, and this is one way of actually uh, using the very powerful language of COC to write, uh, write tactics in COC. Um, one of the things it, it implements the kernel of COC in itself, so you can prove things about it. It formalizes the meta theory of the predictive, predictive calculus of uh, cumulative constructions, so that's the, the calculus of COC. And it's the basis for a certified compiler for COC, uh, which allows certified extraction. Um, so one of the things is if you write a definitional interpreter, you can actually do pre-compilation and have a very smart, a very um, fast compiler uh, just automatically extracted for this. This should also be relevant for your uh, Mitchell Cog project. So what we've done is uh, you take your functional language, uh, for example, uh, in, embedded into Haskell or, or Campbell. Um, so this is your uh, functional smart contract language. Then you print it uh, to Cog. So you, have, you uh, get a deep embedding of the AST. Then you translate in Cog to the MetaCOC uh, AST. So all the transformations you're doing, you can actually reason about and prove to be correct. So now you can do the interpretation of the syntax in COC by the coding and non-coding. Uh, so you can actually connect this to running COC programs. Um, and now we can unquote to get this the shallow embedding. So we both have the deep and the shallow embedding. The deep one is where you actually have the AST in hand. And now we're uh, back to uh, with the shallow embedding, we're back to regular cock programs, and we can easily prove functional correctness properties. And what we've done is to connect this to an execution framework. So we made an execution layer um, somewhat similar to the functionalities you get from uh, from Mikkelsen uh, to get the contract interactions. Uh, I think your laptop went to sleep. So we we have a general uh, specification of what execution layer uh, looks like. It, it takes a number of generated transactions and starts to execute them. Uh, there's one, uh, so, so you can handle these things both in a breadth first uh, way or in a depth first way. So we have two implementations of the execution layer. One that's very much like the Tezos one and another one that's very much like the one for Ethereum. Um, we proved that the Congress, which is basically the core of the infamous uh, DAO contract, uh, is correct. So uh, it, it, our framework actually allows you to prove very substantial uh, properties of substantial smart contracts. I haven't seen anything of this size uh, be verified in a proof system before. Uh, we have two papers on the archive. Uh, the, I leave the links here. I, I guess it will be easy to find. Uh, what we did was to make a, a translation of this Lambda, Lambda Smart uh, language uh, to COG data types and um, COG programs. We have a verified interpreter of this language in COG. We have the soundness of the translation with respect to the dynamic semantics in MetaCOG. So we know that the interpreter is sound because it's just, uh, doing the same thing as, as what COG is doing. So we have user-friendly notations for embedded programs. So you can they just look very much like uh, the the code you've actually been writing in your functional contract, 
functional smart contract language. Um, we get a, a convenient way where we're building more and more tactics in COP to verify uh, functional correctness of these smart contracts. We have a verification of a part of the uh, Acorn smart contract language, um, the standard library, but very similar things should work for any of the other functional languages uh, that are being developed. Up. So I think most of this should be possible to copy, especially because we're also building the infrastructure to do this. And then we have the integration with the execution framework, so we can actually run these smart contracts inside the COG system and reason about safety and uh, temporal properties. So there's some closely related work, but I think you've already seen a, lo a lot of this uh, today, so I'll skip this. Uh, one of some of the things we want to do further, uh, do gas analysis, maybe by uh, just interpreting this in, uh, uh, in Mickelson, because it has a good a uh, good gas model. Um, we also want to formalize an abstract machine. We do an abstraction of the uh, verified interpreter and use it as a reference implementation for the Concordium uh, testing framework. Uh, this is very close to being done, but we could do exactly the same for TESOS. And then, of course, once we have this uh, functional core inside COG system, we can print it to many functional languages. So uh, things like Camelego and SCaml should, should be in scope. It's just printing of a uh, of basically system F to one of the other languages. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, other questions? Any questions? Uh, I have a question. How much more can you do in LTAC than Metacock? Uh, in Metacock, you have you you just have the AST of uh, of Coq in hand, and you have all the power of the uh, the Coq functional language to uh, or or, um, or Kalina to write the uh, write the programs. So it's so it's comparing Kalina to uh, um, to LTAC basically. So in principle, you could write everything in Metacock. Uh, currently, there's still it, it's, I would say it's sort of an alpha phase. There's still quite a few bugs that show up, but it's it's getting it's it's being used in more and more projects. All right, and then are there any additional questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me switch the screen. the conclusion of this workshop. So uh, <coughs> I think it's been great. Uh, thanks to uh, University of Paris and Derif for hosting us. Thanks to all the speakers, uh, because uh, uh, it's been uh, I mean, uh, difficult to, uh, we are in time and uh, everything was fine. And thanks to you for coming. Thanks to uh, um, the um, people from internet for uh, following us. Uh, I would like to uh, give a particular thanks to Marc-Antoine Tréhin and Colin Gonzalez, you, you, you cannot see them, but they are. Uh, Mark Anton has been doing a, 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 an extremely good work in uh, setting up this uh, the logistic of this workshop. So I think we should really uh, give him a round of applause. <laughs> so, so I guess f um <coughs> from this workshop, we can uh, see now that there are a lot of, uh, of work going on. on uh, uh, formal certification and, des and design and, and uh, static analysis of uh, uh, smart contract uh, programming languages. Uh, I guess uh, this gave you ideas uh, for uh, collaboration. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that would be really great to have the uh, different teams working on, on, uh, on, on Tezos and in particular in this area to collaborate, to exchange results. And of course, uh, uh, we are thinking about a next event because we, we this will not be uh, the, the, the only workshop about uh, programming languages. So uh, I, I cannot tell you anything about what uh, uh, things, I mean, what will happen, but uh, 
In the um, spring in Paris, there are uh, quite a few events linked to uh, blockchain technology. There is the Paris Blockchain Week. Uh, there is uh, another event, I don't remember the name. And uh, so we are thinking of organizing something maybe bigger, uh, but uh, uh, there will be uh, uh, something dedicated to uh, um, uh, programming languages and, and formal certification. So I hope to see you then and there. And uh, thank you. Bye bye. Maybe I should have told you that for those who are staying here, there will be uh, this afternoon the defense of uh, habilitation à diriger les recherches of uh, Yann Regis-Janas. It's about work. I don't have the title. Uh, it's somewhere in the university uh, at, at 2 p.m., I guess.